like to, you know, um, get started. I would like to welcome you all. I'm Tom Carter. Um, I guess I'm um, partly responsible for uh, this whole, you know, uh, event, <laughs> you know, in some ways. Um, and I'll be leading our session tomorrow, in our workshop session, and and uh, I guess some, you know, my background. I guess you know, I, I, um, I. Uh, my training is in folklore. Uh, wasn't an architectural historian or a, a, uh, even really a historian. I was interested in folk culture and um, and um, and particularly uh, you know folk architecture. And I um, so I, I wrote my dissertation on early Mormon architecture, and it kind of gave me a, a I guess a foot in um, in in the door here in uh, Utah architectural studies and uh, so I worked at the Utah State Historical Society uh, for uh, for a number of years and then uh, moved up to the University of Utah in the College of Architecture and was there until 2010 so I've been out a long time I can't it's hard to believe now you know um, and um, but been very busy um, uh, doing a number of things, but one of the things that I had been doing is, um, is as a, a little sort of an apostle of field work or whatever, and that's really what I'll be talking about today, um, about the work we'll be doing tomorrow. Uh, we thought, uh, as as part of this, is um, well, really to that we needed not only just to show up in the field and do field work, but uh, um, to get some sort of idea, kind of the reason for why we do this. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a long, involved process, and and so you you really do need to have a um, you know a rationale. I mean, a, a, maybe something to um, you know, so to explain to people what why we're what we're doing and why. And so that's what I'll try to do here. And um, and I, I want to call attention, um, you know, certainly. Uh, to the importance of fieldwork uh, as uh, as one aspect of architectural research, and uh, and also to to talk about um, I mean I think one of the things that we we've really are one of the reasons we're here is really that the, uh, to to I guess in some ways it's a preservation activity we want to uh, preserve really some of the spirit and some of the cooperative. Uh, effort that went into producing um, uh, last year, last June, the uh, Vernacular Architecture Forum conference that we held here. Um, it was a, a, a really a, a great success. Uh, people, um, I mean, they still, people come up to me all the time and say it was still one of the best conferences that, that the Vernacular Architecture Forum ever had. Um, and I think, you know, for, for that, I mean, that's important and something that's good, but I think more importantly for us is it made it really brought together and created this coalition for the first time of people here in Utah who were interested in history and architectural history and archaeology and uh, preservation and um, and architectural design. I mean, we, we have a number of, uh, and cultural resource management. So we have all of these different groups that had been working here, and but working separately. And what the what the conference did, and I think in a, in a, in a really um, powerful way, it brought us all together. We couldn't have done it, uh, and, and no one, no one could have done it alone. And so we had the Utah State Historical Society. We had the University of Utah. We had uh, the, both the Tanner Center. Uh, the Humanities Center and the College of Architecture and Planning, the LDS Church Historical Department. Um, don't know if I say that right. Is it? Is it? What is it now? It changes. It changes. Uh, the Park City Planning Department, uh, Preservation Utah. Um, I still um, I call it the Utah Heritage Foundation, but it's still um, the the Preservation Utah um, organization, and then a number of architecture firms, particularly. Uh, uh, Cooper Roberts, Simonson, and uh, and the Cultural Resource Management, um, and I won't say SPNEA or SP. <laughs> um, it's SWCA um, has been very um, supportive. So we wanted to. Pr one of the things that w that all of us coming out of this this conference, what we really wanted to preserve uh, this coalition, this kind of cooperative effort, because if there is a strength in numbers and. We can rely on each other, and also I, I think it gave us 
for the first time, um, the feeling of being part of a community and people to talk to and um, people who are like-minded and they're interested in old buildings and, and saving old buildings, designing with buildings, uh, a re, you know, sustainability, all of those kinds of things that really uh, were part of this kind of conversation that we had. So we wanted to, keep, to perpetuate that and to keep going and we tried to figure out, well, you know, what, what would be a way of doing that? And um, one of the things that we focused on right off the bat was, was the other thing that I think that came out of this conference was, was this idea for many, uh, I think, uh, discovery for many of us uh, that there was a new and I think a very different way of looking at, um, at, at architecture and archi you know, the architectural landscape. And it was, a, it was, if we want to call it, the, the VAF style of doing this, the Vernacular Architecture Forum um, style or, or approach to architecture and architectural history. But it was, it was a, um, a way, you know, it's a very distinctive uh, and very uh, particular um, uh, approach, you know, to uh, understanding the built environment. And I think, you know, that, that, that really to preserve, again, not only our coalition, but some part of the spirit, this kind of VAF spirit and, and way of looking uh, at the world that we felt was important in carrying forward from the conference. So in some ways, you know, just to explain a little bit about the VAF style, I don't want to get into a little bit, you know, but the, the, the Vernacular Architecture Forum was formed, really it grew out of the 19, late 1970s, but it, it's really part of a larger kind of, uh, of reorientation of, of um, the arts and humanities in the 1960s and 70s, if you want to call it, you know, this cultural revolution or whatever. But there was this, you know, an important intellectual, you know, uh, uh, movement and sort of turmoil, social turmoil of that period that really manifests itself in uh, all aspects of academic life. And what it, it really involved is, you know, kind of rewriting, you know, the history uh, and, uh, and really, I guess, our approach to, you know, American um, uh, landscape that, it, that was more, uh, it was kind of reorientation away, you know, from, you know, a very traditional, um, if you want to call it the great man theory of history or the, you know, great white men you know, theory of history, but to bring in uh, uh, the voices of all people who had been forgotten. And this is really an important part of, they call it sometimes the new social history or the new history or kind of new, even the new architectural history of the period. And what it was is, you know, really the effort to produce a more democratic history, a more democratic story in the sense of, of bringing in all, you know, uh, everyone and not just uh, a minority. And so that we find it is, you know, there's a strong uh, uh, sense of populism, this sense of, of, of everyday life and, you know, that, that, that ordinary people are uh, important or invalid part of our story, um, of being inclusive or, um, uh, you know, people, you know, of, of, of all kind of uh, backgrounds, uh, racial, ethnic, uh, religious, uh, you know, gender, uh, every sexuality, all of these kinds of things, all these people to bring their stories into the larger framework of kind of the, of the American, uh, of American history. And so there's this really incredible um, rewriting, really, I think of, of um, you know, of our story during these years. And then and there's a certain kind of, I call it a, a, a iconoclastic, but there's a sort of sense of, of questioning everything. And there's nothing you, you, you really, you know, you look at the, uh, everything in with a certain amount of suspicion, you know, and try to figure, well, what does it really mean? What are the texts or the subtexts of, of, of so much of what we've been looking at? And then finally, there's a real strong political aspect to it, you know, uh, in this period, you know, um, if you want to call it sort of leftist, um, populism, um, but clearly this idea of the common person, the common, you know, um, you know, every day, bringing that in, that story in, and to make sure that um, that uh, the ruling class, you know, was uh, as aware uh, of of this particular, um, you know, change in orientation. So it's it's a it's really it's and it really goes through all everything, you know, architecture. Uh, uh, history, 
uh, you know, folklore, my own background, uh, all anthropology. It's a real, it's a sweeping kind of uh, uh, reorientation that, that it really occurs in the 70s and 80s. So the VAF grows out of that, and it's, a, um, it's an interesting um, thing because, you know, so, you know, particularly in architectural studies that, you know, for, for so long had been really oriented towards what I call the history of architecture, um, which was kind of, uh, you know, that basically you use history to understand architecture. And um, basically it became a history, um, you know, of, of the styles and fashions of design pedigrees and particularly, you know, uh, the, the stories of, of famous architects. Everybody knows um, these buildings. I mean, these are the ones that, uh, that we were raised with a lot in our, you know, architectural history classes uh, in, in the old days, I think. Um, uh, and really, you know, kind of linked, you know, so much of a landscape that's linked to uh, a very wealthy elite. But that's really what, you know, it's still there and it's, these buildings are still important. But, it, but in fact, I mean, what we're having, what we've seen with the vernacular architecture movement is a shift to what I call architectural history. So there's architecture, there's the history of, of architecture, you know, which is really about buildings. But the architectural history in this definition really sees architecture not as an end in itself, but as a tool for understanding people and their social and cultural values. So that you essentially, you know, instead of doing, using history to do architecture, <laughs> in this sense, you know, we're using architecture to do history. To use, you know, using buildings as really as evidence uh, of a particular um, values. And I mean, I could use my neighborhood. I just picked these, you know, whatever, because, you know, so, you know, you, you know, everybody can probably, you know, say, yeah, this was, you know, part of this movement towards, uh, you know, uh, we, we called them period cottages, I think, when we kind of tried to name these things, you know, in the 1980s. But can these historical periods, so that some can be Spanish colonial or English Tudor or these kinds of things. And so that you can talk about, you know, them as a, as a part uh, of these kind of, archi of architectural movement. But at the same time, what they really, you know, as from, a, from this other perspective, from a cultural perspective, what you see is that I, I think you can really understand them better as examples, a very conservative reaction to, you know, the post-World War I period, you know, where the Bauhaus, I mean, you know, in Europe, people are moving forward towards modernism and whatever, and embracing, you know, the, the steel and glass and concrete and all these things. And in America, what we do is we hunker down and we go backwards. You know, seriously, I mean, you know, if you look at it, this is the period of the colonial revival. This is the period, you know, where we're, you know, trying to rediscover, um, you know, uh, our, our colonial roots, you know, and Anglo roots. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, looking back to kind of these sort of pre-modern medieval forms, I mean, that we see, you know, so that there's a real meaning to them. They're not just buildings. They're really an expression of this whole new, or, or not new, but it's, a, it's this prevailing attitude during the interwar period of kind of hunkering down and kind of withdrawing from the world. And um, it is... Uh, you know, so we can really look at those and see them, you know, as part of this. So it's, it shifts again, again, from this idea uh, of a history of architecture. This is, you know, Michigan, I mean, down at Harvard. So we shift from just looking at buildings like this to really looking at, you know, the, um, the, the buildings as uh, indications of social and cultural values. And again, so we can see in the 20s, they were really you know, important to express this kind of conservatism. I mean, now what's going on, I mean, in terms of, of our history, is that these are buildings are too small. <laughs> and I mean, this is my street, so I, can, I see this happening all the time. But you, know, you can't have a you know, 2,000 square foot house. And so you tear it down and you build one that looks almost exactly like, but it's twice, as, twice the size. <laughs> you know? So that's part, you know, so, looking at these buildings, again, historically, you know, as evidence. You know, we can think of them, you know, we can describe them or whatever, but we really need to look at these, these larger kind of issues um, that, are, that, they're, uh, that they really, they, they help us understand and uh, hopefully, um, you know, chronicle as part of our theme. And what that does 
is it shifts really the attention. And this is one of the things that we learned uh, in producing the Archi Vernacular Architecture Forum booklets, is it shifts us away from really looking at um, you know, architects and um, you know, design you know, uh, you know, styles and so forth, to really looking at buildings as evidence of, of historical uh, of, of values and movements. So it was, uh, um, you know, so it, sh it shifts us, you know, here's my, this is my house, you know, I have, it's the only, I, one of these I've, you know, um, but it's, you know, we start seeing, you know, we can see it, you know, as, as a document, as a historical document, it's not just a, you know, piece of architecture, but it tells us an important, you know, I, I don't want to get into what it tells us about the occupant, you know, particularly, <laughs> that might get into a little bit, you know, too tr much trouble, but, you know, so on the outside, this little English kind of, uh, you know, facade at the same time on the inside, you know, very traditional, very conservative type of bungalow plan, um, you know, with the, you know, with the bedrooms, uh, you know, that are kind of book, that uh, bookend a, a bathroom on the side, and then the big kind of open dining room, uh, um, uh, living room, I mean, dining room, living room area. So that we start seeing these things as documents of, of um, you know, of people's, you know, the kinds of things that work for them and what do they want in, in buildings and, um, and when they don't work, you know, obviously uh, they often get changed. So that we shift our, you know, attention to what I, you know, increasingly have been calling this activity of studying the unstudied. That's my new catchphrase. Um, but basically if you decide to look at ordinary buildings, if you decide, you know, that, that you're, you want to expand your view to, you know, to this kind of sort of democratic um, uh, perspective, you know, where you're really, you know, inclusive and bringing all the kinds of things, is that you're going to find real quickly that your sources of, uh, you know, of information are going to dry up pretty quickly. Um, you know, people who built kind of ordinary buildings uh, are often people that didn't, you know, that nobody wrote about, and uh, they didn't write much about them themselves. Uh, they show up rarely in, um, you know, in sort of more standard histories. Uh, we can learn a little bit about them in the social records, you know, things like the census records and, um, and uh, other kinds of demographic uh, um, uh, in, uh, sources. But you're not going to really, you're not going to study them in, you know, the traditional sort of archives and libraries and so forth. And, what it means is that you're going to have to really start going to really to them. Uh, one of the things that we've learned is that in studying ordinary buildings, that the buildings themselves are the best evidence. I mean, if you want to learn about one, um, you know, study the unstudied, then you really have to go to it. You have to go to them uh, wherever you know, if it's in you know the city or the um, the country, um, and that involves doing field work. And here, you know, so <laughs> here we are. Um, but it really, um, it, it, it we, the, I think it really at the, at the heart of this whole um, uh, effort really is this sense of, of trying to see the buildings as a historical document and learning how to read them is really what we're gonna be working uh, 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 on, the, you know, t certainly tomorrow. But hopefully, in a series, if we continue these workshops, you know, the more comfortable you are with the documentation process, the more um, uh, readily you're going to be able to learn how to actually read the fabric and understand what you're seeing. Um, and that's really, again, part of the whole process. So that we're going to go out, you know, that we do field work, and we do it in, you know, rural areas. Um, done a lot of work in Indiana where. Um, I went to school um, with German communities there. Um, this is a, a, a nice, you know, a log house that, um, that we documented a number of years ago. Um, even, you know, sort of urban areas, this is the Tenement Museum and, you know, on the, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, when the Vernacular Architecture Forum me uh, meeting was in, uh, in New York uh, in 2004, we, um, we actually teamed with the Tenement Museum and we found out that they really, um, they had some architectural drawings, but they didn't have any really, you know, just good, you know, floor plan drawings of, some, of their of building. And so we helped them do that and do the field work for that. So that, and it really, you can kind of see how it opens up and 
um, lets you understand how this particular building uh, may have been used. So we work in rural, urban areas, different kinds of buildings, houses, uh, tenements, uh, commercial buildings, and so forth. You know. So I think you know, that field work is really, it's really the defining feature uh, of vernacular architecture uh, style research. Um, it's not um, you know, a panacea. I mean, you, know, you, there's, you, you have to see it um, as, a, as one aspect of, of, of research. I mean, we're still working in libraries. We're still trying to understand um, you know, finding the owner's names and trying to as much as we can. But building this evidence and actually trying to understand and learn from the actual building fabric, I think is one of the things that really characterizes um, this type of, of VAF experience. So field work involves a number of things, Photo photography. Photography is you know, probably the easiest. Um, certainly, uh, we, we sometimes call it road scholarship, you know, because you can do it from the road. <laughs> You don't have to. You don't have to actually sort of like, um, uh, you know, talk to anybody, <laughs> which, which is a problem. I mean, one of the things we'll talk about a lot, you know, as we, as we, um, as we, um, as we move further into this. I think I think being an architectural field worker is sort of like being a. a door-to-door -door salesman or a vacuum cleaner salesman. You know, you, you ring the doorbell and you've got about three or four seconds, you know, to, or at least or three or four minutes, you know, to explain what you're doing and why you want to measure someone's house. But it's, uh, anyway, it's, but photography is, is, is an important aspect of it. And it was something we'll be talking about, you know. Um, I learned the hard way. I probably have more horrible photographs than any other, you know, you know backlit, I mean, you name it. Um, with the digital stuff, it's so much easier now because you can see what you're doing and you know, uh, you know what's working. Photography is important. Oral history is really important in terms of field work. Um, you know, talking to people. Part of this is by necessity. I mean, like I said, to get in um, and you know, convince someone to you know to to uh, allow you to uh, to document their building uh, means that you're going to have to speak to them. You're going to have to get out uh, and interact with them. But also, you have to you know, you you really want to um, you know listen to them. Um, uh, whether you know we we did some work reconstructing. This is how we reconstructed the old Fairview uh, meeting house. There were a number of people when I was there in the late '70s who could remember it very well. It had been torn down. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when, but these all these people went to church there. This is uh, the LDS meeting house in Fairview, Utah. And so I was able to, you know, sketch out the plan and then, and, you know, and, and essentially interview people about what it was like. You know, where was the, you know, the rostrum and, how, you know, was it double aisle, single aisle, all these people, and they could kind of draw it out for me. Um, or, or use, building use, particularly, um, you know, for more contemporary buildings. Uh, how are they used and how uh, do they work? Uh, this is us on the top interviewing a, a number of, of ranch people out in Elko County. Uh, about how uh, some of the, their uh, work buildings were used. Um, and so th those kinds of things are really important while you're there. One of the things that as we do a lot of field work, um, and the people who have done it with me, um, you realize that uh, the owner is probably going to talk to you the whole time you two or two, you know. <laughs> so you're going to be trying to work while they're talking, you know. And so it, it takes a real, um, it's an art not to um, in some ways say, you know, this would go a lot faster if I could just be alone, you know. But it's, it's, it's all part of it, you know, and it's, um, you know, and it's, it's one of the things that I think prevents a lot of people from really doing it, um, a lot of it, because it does mean you, you, uh, you have to get out of your car, you know, and you have to explain what you're doing. And the, so we've got photography and we've got oral history and, um, you know, and, but in terms of field work, um, probably the most important um, is, um, uh, our, our measured drawings, you know, and, and you know, we'll, we'll try to explain, I'll try to explain certainly, you know, the rest of the time today, you know, why I think they're just so, so important, um, but also why, you know, we're going to be spending the day tomorrow uh, learning how to do them. And uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a really an important part of the documentation process for a great number of reasons. Um, and I, I want to say right at the beginning, you know, is that everybody can do it. I mean, I had a grafting class when I was about, I don't know, in eighth grade. <laughs> uh, 
and I can remember his name was Mr. Larson, and I can still remember doing it. But it really, um, it was enough for me really to uh, to move on and to you know to doing kind of architectural documentation. And I'll show you. We use graph paper, and we um, you know we don't you don't have to be an artist. Uh, you don't have to be an architect. Um, you don't have to be um, you know even. <laughs> I mean, I, I was going to say having any kind of sensibility of, you know, proportion or anything, because I have very little, you know. So, um, it's, it's a, it's a, it, anyway, it's something that really it's accessible. It's something that we can uh, do, all of us could do. And one of the things that hopefully that we'll be doing in these workshops is demystifying it a little bit. And one of the problems I think that we have is that there has, there's a long history of, of architectural documentation. And I think that for those of us who are in working, you know, in history and, and preservation, we're familiar with the National Park Service uh, style, um, which is uh, basically, a, uh, we call it Habs Hair, the Historic American Building Survey, uh, the, or the American Historic Engineering um, Record, and, uh, you know, the Historic American Landscape Survey. So these different Habs Hair halls, you know, are the, some ways, you know, um, sometimes I guess, you know, that they're there, but, but they're the culprit, I think, in making us feel like, you know, that we can't do this stuff, you know. And it's a really different, it's wholly a different ball game with these guys. I mean, first of all, I mean, it's um, the, 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 the rationale. I mean, a lot of the, this begins, I mean, obviously, um, it comes from during the Depression to hire architects, you know, during the WPA. Uh, Public Works Administration and stuff that was where ha uh, HABS starts. But it really gr draws on a, a, a tradition of colonial revival architectural design. You know, in New England, um, there were a number of, of architects in the late 19th and early 20th century who were really interested in colonial architecture, not his historians, but also but to recreate it for their clients. The clients wanted a really nice colonial house, but they didn't want an old one, they wanted a new one. So a lot of architects, particularly you know, in Connecticut and Rhode Island and Massachusetts, went out and drew these um, uh, you know, standing buildings you know, so that they could recreate them. And in some ways, that tradition moves to, to uh, Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, they bring that, you know, the idea of you know, documenting uh, Virginia buildings so that they could recreate them uh, at, at Williamsburg. So there is this tradition, and then it really it, it gets picked up really by the by the Park Service during the you know the 30s during the Depression these make work projects, and has continued to this day. Um, primarily, you know, Habs drawings, um, and I'll shorten it to that. But Habs drawings are are, are different than the, what we're doing, uh, or what I, the, the VAF style, because first of all, they're um, uh, they're you know tremendously detailed. Uh, they're supposed to allow. Uh, a recreation, you know, so, uh, uh, an architect or a builder to recreate a building so that they're, you know, very, very uh, systematic and very detailed. They're unreflective, they're as is drawings so that they don't look, they don't, you know, Habs architects who do these drawings are not taught to read the buildings. They just, you know, you're supposed to just draw them, you know, and whatever they, you know, what, whatever you see, uh, you, you take it um, as. Um, as it, uh, is all being legitimate, you know, or well, not legitimate, it's not the right word, but, you know, all being um, of the same value. Whereas what we'll do, as I'll show you, is that we're looking for periods, we're looking for how a building grows and how it's reused and reused and so forth, and really looking always to interpret it. And finally, Habs drawings are incredibly labor int intensive. Uh, I must admit, you know, that um, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm still astounded. I, you know, there was a, a guy that I know who is a Park Service architect who did a lot of drawings. He, his name is Rich, Rich Cronenberger, and he, uh, uh, anyway, he, he would, uh, he'd probably be laughing along with me a little bit, but he, he came and he was coming through town, and so he came and up to school and, and gave a little, you know, workshop lecture um, to my students um, about uh, his work drawing Gunston Hall. Uh, which is on the Potomac, you know, just uh, down from the uh, river from uh, Mount Vernon. And he, you know, he was, he was talking about particularly the portico and, and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the detail that he showed all these drawings and he showed the field drawings and all this kind of stuff. And finally, one of the students said, 
how long did it take you to do that? He said, well, the portico alone was three months, you know? <laughs> and we're kind of laughing. We said, we've got three hours. <laughs> and I'm serious. You know, when, you, when someone let, lets you in, you know, their house, you know, sometimes you're not even going to get three hours. You're going to get three minutes, you know, 30 minutes or whatever. You know, so we can't do that kind of level of, of detailed of, 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 of documentation. Every now and then, we're, we'll get a chance, you know, because, um, the, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, maybe it's a government building or uh, it's being torn down and nobody cares about it or whatever. But by and large, you know, we got to be, you know, it's quick and dirty. I hate to say it, you know, and I'm, you know, that's really one of the things that characterizes what we do. But I'll say it's, re it's realistic, you know, and I don't think it's dummied it down. Um, this is, you know, some, you know, a field sketch I made of, of if you can see it, of uh, the Simmelmeyer House in southern Indiana. And, you know, I had, um, you know, I probably had, you know, probably an hour to work on this building. And you, you know, for me, you know, I, I, I'm interested in, um, in ratios and, you know, particularly in this neoclassical tradition, what I call sort of vernacular neoclassicism and how these older kind of Renaissance ratios are transmitted into uh, everyday life, you know, in 19th century Indiana, you know, by a German immigrant, you know. But so, I, you know, I tend to, you know, if I can, you know, draw an elevation just so I can find out, you know, I can test my, my ratio theories and stuff. But so that, you know, that we, we're always, um, you know, I said not dumbing it down, but we're making decisions about what we're going to spend our time with. Now, let's talk about that more, too. And it, I, I just want to impress so, you know, if, if I can, you, you with this idea that, you know, that's really, that we can all do this. And, you know, luckily over the years after, you know, doing this for 30 years, or even longer, you know, I mean, some of my early drawings are just so bad, but, you know, and even when I first started the university, I, I thought that, you know, that the architecture students could, you know, just draw, and they thought they could draw, but, you know, ultimately what we've, we've learned is that we have to really work towards, you know, um, you measure, well, working to scale. And I'll explain all that stuff. So that we're really using graph paper, we're using measurements, and, uh, and really um, it's, a, it's a type, I've been teaching it now at the University of Wisconsin. Um, we, use it, we used it in the last years up at the University of Utah, University of Wisconsin, Indiana University, uh, Smith College kids got it, you know, and so, and like these drawings, I mean, really, it's particularly this, you know, there's some of the Wisconsin students, and this is Kate, you know, her first one of her first field, <laughs> field days, you know, but, you know, that basically, you know, these are, these are the drawings, I mean, and these are people, the drawings, you know, done by people who really have never drew, drew, uh, drawn buildings before, and, you know, they're not ink, these are, you know, pencil drawings, but I mean, they are, you know, it's, it's, it's very doable, that's what I'm trying to say. And we can do really good stuff, you know, it's stuff that's publishable. You know, now that you can scan, you know, pencil drawings, it really makes it um, a lot easier. So I just want to have, you know, that we really have to be confident about that, you know. I mean, it's not something you say, oh, I can't, you know, I mean, I can't use a mechanical pencil. Well, well, if you can't, then maybe you can't <laughs> draw, you know. Maybe there is, maybe a bottom line, you know. <laughs> but basically, I mean, it's something we can all do. And there's two different kinds of drawings. We do field, we do field drawings and then finished drawings. Um, we're going to be concentrating on field drawings, you know, because by and large, that's what we're... Um, anymore, you know, it, it does take quite a bit more work, you know, to kind of move from kind of the field uh, you know, stage to the finish stage. And we do it, at least in, in, for me, we do it all by hand, hand inking still. Um, not many people do that. Um, mostly with its uh, computer-aided design, probably Revit now, is that what everybody? So what, what I'd like to do is, as we move on with this, is to really uh, is to move on and um, give us, you know, all of some experience in, chain, you know, in, in turning our field sheets into final drawings, you know, because that's, you know, it's really, it's really important part of it. Like I said, I still, you know, ink and, and um, because I think in some ways a lot of the buildings that I deal with, you know, particularly ranch buildings and so forth, you know, they don't look very good when they're coming out of a plotter. And so, anyway. 
Although I will say some of the architecture students can make now, you know, with different, they can make Adobe look like Adobe. It's, it's quite amazing. So we'll kind of work on that. So what we're going to be doing is um, we're going to be learning, you know, field work. Um, and when I say this, I mean, we're going to be concentrating, you know, I'm going to assume that most people, um, you know, feel comfortable with their cameras and, um, you know, an oral history is a whole another, whole another uh, uh, endeavor, which I won't really get into. But we're going to be concentrating on, on doing measured drawings. And there are some, you know, I think rules. I, I think we'll kind of learn. I think the first one and the most basic one is that, you know, that basically we, we call it the scholarship of field work. Um, it means that we're interested in the actual process, not the product. So the fieldwork process, not the actual sort of drawing as a product. And what that means is that what we're really using the architecture, you know, the drawing process uh, for is to, is to learn about the building. I used to, you know, there was a colleague of mine up at the university, his name was uh, uh, Antonio Serrato. Conde, you know, I mean, he was like, and Tony was, was a, um, he was, he really liked, you know, technology, and he'd always say, Tom, you know, you can, you can, you know, we can, you know, produce a set of drawings of that building without ever even going there, you know, just take a picture and one measurement, and I can do the whole thing, you know, with photogrammetry or, you know, computer or whatever like that, and I'd say, Tony, that's not the, that's not the point, you know, we, you know, anybody can get a scanner, a laser scanner or something like that and get a drawing, but you've learned nothing. The whole idea of fieldwork is to, is to experience a building and, um, and sort of in, in an intimate way, you know, where you can understand where it came from, something about, I mean, I still kind of a romantic about this stuff, you know, the old Ruskinian, you know, John Ruskin, the idea that you're, you're touching, you know, by look, you know, touching this fabric, you know, you're actually connected with the people who, who were builders, you know, who did it, who lived there. And so there's that experiential quality, but there's also, you know, it's a, it's, it's a um, educational kind of system. I don't know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not an architect, but until you've, so for me, you know, being able to draw, you know, a plate assembly, you know, where the roof attaches to the wall or the, jo the floor joists, how they're actually, uh, uh, um, how they're, they're integrated into a building, with, without, I, I can't, I mean, I can't understand that without drawing it. I mean, I really mean I can take a picture of it and stuff, but until you've actually kind of seen what they've done, um, and some of it's so incredibly intricate and you know, it astounds you. And you can't help but come away with this feeling of, of an incredible kind of admiration for these people that were working, you know, and very, on sometimes very simple buildings or outwardly simple buildings. But so it's that whole, you know, it's that learning process. So, you know, I just want to, uh, you know, impress upon you. You know, uh, we will we'll talk about a lot tomorrow too. But this idea that what what the whole idea of of um, of drawing is not to produce a drawing. You know, which will, will it's useful in a number of ways, but it's the process of learning how to read while you're doing it. So there's a fieldwork style that really VF, you know, that um, you know, drawing style or kind of a documentation style that will kind of again. Uh, will be impressing uh, upon you. Um, you know, you can kind of see the difference, you know, between Hab's drawings. I mean, they're not as intricate, they're not as, um, but, you know, the periods, this is a little house over in the avenues, um, and you can see it was built in two stages. I've got, you know, the, the, it was originally as a one-room house here on the right that had an addition to the back, um, and, you know, probably dates from the early 1860s. It's a, it's a great little house. Um, but this is, you know, kind of, you know, the, also, you know, the, what I could see was the casings and some, you know, I was interested in how, you know, the, how the, um, the rafters uh, were attached. Um, uh, and of course, I made a, a detail of that. So we'll be working on all of these kinds of things. So some, some of the basic, you know, um, rules, um, you know, I mean, well, not quite yet. Um, one of the things that I will say is that we do, the, the drawings though are, are important. I mean, besides just learning, and I just say in a couple of different ways. First of all, they're, they're an incredible um, record in terms of, if you're, if you're interested in historic preservation, 
uh, were, you know, ordinary vernacular buildings disappear at a great a rate, I mean, much higher rate than, you know, more the, gra the grander buildings, you know, that tend to get preserved. Um, so that they disappear really quickly. So a drawing, um, it right, you know, really will probably be, the, in many cases, the only record we have of a particular building. And this one, I, I always just use this because I, I still kick myself. I was, I was driving down to, I, was, I can't remember what I was doing. I was giving a little talk in St. George or something. And, and I was going through Scipio kind of late in the evening. You can kind of see the sun is going down. And, and I, you know, it's my first time in the little town of Scipio, which is down there near Fillmore. And I just saw this great, great house. And you can see it. It's got this, I don't know if you can kind of see it, but this kind of Gothic tracery underneath the dormers. And, these round arches, you know, window heads and all this stuff, and it was great. And I talked to the guy, and, and, and I said, well, you know, I'll be back in the spring, and I'll draw it up, and it'll be really great. And so I got, I got there, when I got there in the spring, this is what was left, you know. <laughs> and I always, I'll always, you know, these are the things that I always, I always kick myself, you know. Why didn't I just take that extra hour, you know, or two hours, or whatever it would have taken, um, and, and, and document it? Because then we would have the record. So the drawing, you know, number, you know, on one level is, is, a, is a form of preservation, historic preservation. Um, my students used to always laugh at me and they'd say, well, you, all you really care about is drawing it and then they can tear it down. And you know, I'd say, well, that's you know, not quite true, but, uh, you know. The other thing, and, and you know, I, I sort of argue about this, but, you know, with people, but, but I think they're really important parts of, you know, structure site assessments, you know, of reports. I think, you know, a drawing, it allows you, this is a house over in the avenues, but you know, just if you can kind of, you know, as part of your report, you know, you know where, where you have, um, you know, uh, uh, where the work needs to be done, you know, where you've got deterioration, if you can kind of show that as part of, of on a, on a um, you know, an architectural document, I think it's very important, you know, for builders and for architects and so forth as they move on with the building restoration uh, and rehabilitation. So I think, um, you know, the type, this type of drawing would be really important uh, for that kind of work. Um, buildings, a, a drawing also can, you know, they say a photograph is worth, you know, a thousand uh, words and uh, probably one good drawing is worth a thousand photographs. So particularly, like this is the Meiwa, which is a, a shop house, a Chinese American shop house up in, um, in Chinatown in Butte, Montana. And as part of the VAF, uh, conference that was up in Butte, you know, we I took a number of students, we went up and drew this building. And, and you know, from the outside, it looks exactly like, you know, a, a, an American commercial building, you know. Well, as we got inside, you know, it was unbelievably cool. I mean, this is just a section cut through it, you know, and so you can see all of the different, you know, levels of, of what's going on here. Again, from the outside, yeah, it's impossible to see that it has this mezzanine. So it has a, it had a basement which was for male boarders, you know, the opium den kind of deal, and which was really true. I mean, was, you know, and then the first floor are always you know, some kind of farm. They're often pharmacies on the Sanborn maps, or drug stores, or um, you know, some kind of commercial activity on the on the main floor. Uh, and then a mezzanine that's kind of tucked in. You can't even see it, but this is where the families lived. You can kind of see that, I mean, you, now you can kind of recognize that there were the, that second set of windows is, is uh, this mezzanine, this family living area. And then finally on the top floor, some kind of public space. Usually, uh, in this case, it was a noodle house. It can be a temple. It can be a Buddhist temple. We've seen them. Um, and so, but these are really classic, you know, these kind of multiple layered buildings that are really classic, you know, Chinese American buildings in the American West. And we've, um, you know, I've, I've, I'd, I'd like to look, I've, I've got th three or four more of them that I've do documented and I'd like to, and it, they're just really fascinating to me. It, none of them are, you know, from the outside, you would ever have any idea what was going on. They're even more, they're actually even more, more interesting because they're built around these big light wells. They kind of, they're almost like courtyards that they've used these light wells to, you know, to create these spaces on the inside. So, you know, the drawings we do use in a, a number of, of um, in, in a number of ways that are important. Um, so I said, you know, process is there, but you know, the actual product is, is very valuable too. So 
just in terms of some basic rules as we get as we start doing this, I think the first one is a friend of mine, he called it, you know, the most for the least. Um, one of the things that you have to remember about field work is, that, you know, that the price, and I've heard this said a number of times, the real cost of field work or the price of field work is time. I mean, it's, you know, if, if you're, um, you know, if, if you're budgeting in it or doing any kind of thing, you know, it's, the, the amount of time, you know, field work takes is really uh, significant. So you have to always, in some ways, decide what is, the, what is the most amount of information about a building that you can get through field work for the least amount of time spent. And it sounds kind of, I don't know, maybe a little bit uh, uh, superficial or whatever, you know, but in fact, it's, you know, it's really the truth. And so, you know, we, okay, we, you, know you run across this incredible barn out in, you know, out in Elko County, Nevada, kind of a buckaroo barn, and you know, do you, you know, do you draw the whole thing? You know, let's say if you've got, even if, you know, we had access to this forever, but, you know, do you spend, you know, two days drawing this thing? Well, what was really important to us, you know, the decision we made was the truss system, you know, these corbel trusses, you know, and how it was actually sort of, you know, that, you know, how the roof, you know, worked, and then also how it fit, you know, it was banked, bermed back into um, the hillside. So that's what we, you know, we, we, spend our time doing. We did a plan of it, but, but at the same time, in terms of the extra field work, what we did is, um, is really, um, you know, is focusing on what we thought was important. So one of the things that we're going to do tomorrow is the first thing that you ever do, you know, when you're um, going to do uh, architectural drawings or documentation is that you spend some time walking around the building and trying to figure out what's important, what's the most where are you going to get the most bang for your buck in terms of the time spent? Um, you know, the elevations. Uh, I mean, I sort of say we, we sort of say the bottom line is you always do a plan because it gives you the spatial dim and dimension and where people really, you know, or animals or whatever, you know, really uh, where, where that activity occurs. But after that, you know, what where, what is what's important? It could be a detail. Sometimes. Um, you know, right now I'm interested in details, so I've been drawing, you know, just like mantles, you know, and doing the plan and then, you know, an, an old, you know, kind of the fireplace around or something. So you'll have to make that decision and everyone's going to have their own, but, um, you know, you'll have to, um, you know, you'll have to make a decision. We did this, a good example of this is this, uh, we were doing, as part of our, um, one of my field schools that I was, uh, well, a early one that we were working uh, for the Library of Congress uh, on a project. They were working on, on Italians in the American West. And we have down in, in Helper, was a, there was a large Italian population. And we found um, a house that was owned by one of the old families, the old Italian families, the, the Brunos. And we, we understood, as we talked to them, again, this is a little bit of oral history, um, we, we discovered that the most important aspect of their Italianness was food which was great for us, you know. I mean, I probably had, we had the best meals I've ever had. At Yol Her name was Yolanda. She was really great. And they just took us in and stuff. But so what we decided, you know, that there was a great bungalow. I mean, it was really wonderful. And, but we decided, you know, where we were going to put our, our, our uh, attention initially was to the garden. And it's not, it doesn't show up real well here, just, but, but so we ended up kind of doing kind of a whole, you know, set of measured drawing of the, uh, of the actual, of, of her garden. And, you know, she had her, you know, where the, the fava beans were and, you know, all her different herbs and so forth, you know, and how it was irrigated and so forth, you know, because that was the really, that was really the essence of this building. And if, if you were going to nominate this building to the National Register, probably it would be for, <laughs> for its garden. You know, I hate to say it, you know, I don't know how you do that, but it's ephemeral. But it was still the most important aspect of it. And the other thing that we found out as we started to look at, you know, is too, is that there was a little food processing building in behind. So that, again, tied into the whole, you know, uh, and this is where, again, you would, if you were in your car, you would just drive by this little building. Even if you photographed it as an example of sort of corrugated metal, you know, <laughs> architecture or something like that, you wouldn't see what was really going on. And is that they used the, 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 
the, the main floor was all for herb drying, and they just had, this is all oregano, you know, just, you know, drying out, you know, in the, and, um, and of course, implements and stuff like that. And then the basement was for wine and sausage. Uh, and so there was sausage hooks, big barrels, you know, for wine making, and then, you know, these hooks to, you know, to, to dry the sausage. And then there was actually, which is, you know, just outside of, on the back here, there was a little room of, to, uh, uh, um, that they rented out, you know, to miners, you know, so that they could make some extra money. So this little building really became, you know, in some ways, you know, the center of activity on the Bruno farm, uh, uh, city lot. You know, the house was, was nice and it was kind of great, you know, and whatever, but all this other stuff was going on around that, that again, if you, if you stayed in your car, you would miss the whole thing. So what you have to do, you know, you always have to ask yourself, you know, when you're looking at a building, you're like, what, what is, you know, what's the most amount of information you're going to get for the time that you're going to take? Um, what would you, what, what doesn't this tell, photo tell us? What would you do? On the, this is the Duke Frank Hogan in Mexican water, which is, we drew as part of Design Build Bluff. You know. Yeah, and why about the, why would you want the interior? To understand the relationship of the thickness of the material, perhaps its thermal properties to be yeah. yeah. Exactly, because these are, you know, they're ceremonial now, too, so you'd have, you see a change. You know, they only do now kind of ceremonial, you know, things here, but it, yeah, but obviously it was, a, you know, this was the house. And, um, and, and I really like that idea of, you know, the, the, you know, the thickness and understanding, you know, the, the thermal qualities of, of those kind of walls. What else? You want to know the structure is behind that. Yeah, how would you, how do you? How do you build one of these things? You know, <laughs> I mean, really, seriously. I mean, how many hogans have you drawn by? You know, driven by. You know, and you kind of go, you know, you know. So, so we did. You know, and it was pretty. You know, it's, this was a this is a pretty cool one. I mean, you know, and it doesn't. You know, Bob, I'm a little bit. You know, we never did a section. You know, which which you would have done. You know, but I think you know. But here you can see it. There, there are these vertical posts. You know, that are coal. They're ground. They're earth fast. I mean, they're they're cedar poles that are just you know driven into the ground. And then there's a, you know, a, a, they just stack, you know, um, timbers. These were often, these were railroad ties that they were, they were stacked um, uh, in really sort of octagonally, or, you know, not octagonally, but I mean, it's, I don't know how many sides it has, but, you know, and then they pack it in with, uh, with the straw and the, and the mud. So that, you, you know, just by taking a little bit of extra time, you know, you, uh, you know that you can understand you know, how building was used, what kind of space. We know that they face east, um, and the west side is for, you know, the, uh, is, is, um, uh, is female space, is gender space. And so you start understanding all of these things. You know, it also is also lots of cats uh, were living in here. <laughs> it smelled like cats. <laughs> Anyway, I'm just joking, but I'll say, but anyway, so here's one, here's another building, you know, why would you draw this and what would you think? This is, this was down on 6th West, you know, 6th West and North South, it got torn down for, a, a, to make a, you know, um, high rise apartment, part of the redevelopment of this area, pardon? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's really an important thing. You know, first of all, you know, one of the things that we often draw, you know, you, you never want to draw an ele elevation if you don't have to, you know, because it, it really, they take the most time. But often if you want, let's say, if you want a, some kind of idea of this building, I mean, really, with the trees and stuff in front of it, you know, you really, you, you would have to, you know, that's one of the uh, instance where you would, draw maybe an elevation yeah and you can't see but in Bob is right it's got a it's really actually pretty cool it's got this Victorian uh, building on to, on the side of it um, and that was actually kind of a little Victorian cottage that was actually sort of pushed right up against it and um, you know again we made the decision because we didn't have much, that much time that we didn't draw that you know we drew the actual older building but we didn't draw the you know the cottage I still. This one. Yeah. Well, it was interesting, you know, and I should, I should, you know, because we actually did a full set of like elevations and draw and and plans of this. 
Um, it faced, it was, it was interesting, I mean, you know, it faced it, the narrow end, it was an urban kind of idea, you know, and you see that back east a lot, you know, where you have a house that's a farmhouse type, you know, that has the door um, in the long side and then the, par the ridge would be parallel to the public space to the street. But in urban areas where you're, you know, looking to sp save space and stuff, you'll turn those on their end. And we see, you know, God, you know, I was thinking, you know, even in Northampton, there's a ton of that, you know. I mean, you know, it's where in New England particularly, you know, they'll take these older farmhouses, they'll turn them on their ends so that they, they take up small, you know, uh, these city lots, you know, you'll see them. So this was one of the rare examples that I've found of that. I mean, we know that there was a bunch of them because of the Sanborn maps, but to see a, you know, a rare surviving one, you know, we tried to argue for its preservation, but it didn't, it didn't work. So yeah, so, and periodization is really important, and I, I can't show that, you know, I don't know if you, the, the Victorian cottage is right over here, and clearly, you know, it, it got a, you know, a bay window, I mean, a, a picture window when they did that. So all of those things, you know, we, you know, of course we were lucky they were tearing, not lucky, but while they were tearing it down, you know, we were really able to do a number of things, you know, in terms of, you know, trying to understand, you know, the, 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 uh, the roof construction, uh, the collared beam, you know, how the pocketing worked here, you know, things like that. And, you know, then details, you know, but the casings, these are, this is a field sheet. So, but we've really interesting, um, you know, it's one of the only places that, well, two different kinds of, of adobe construction. And then what we found here, uh, the, the fireplaces were really great. They were, um, instead of having mantles, they just had wallpaper. They had like a little kind of architrave, like a um, uh, picture frame. And then they just had wallpaper around them, you know, so that you could, um, I mean, you know, that it, you know, it looked, it looked like a fireplace, you know, but it, but it really wasn't, you know. It was really... Anyway, so, yeah, so it, you're always making these kinds of decisions, you know, and because of time, and very rarely do we find. So, in some ways, you know, the, the whole process is, is such a, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's always one of discovery. And you never know, you know, like what you're going to get, you know. Um, this, we worked up on the Crow Indian Reservation for three summers as part of uh, the university uh, field school that I, that, I, that I ran. And one of this was a, a student, you know, just drawing this little, it was just this little uh, building. They call it the Red Bird Family House, the Real Bird Family House. And, and we couldn't figure, I don't know, it's just this little one-room house with, a, with one, no windows. And you know, with one, you know, door on the east side. Well, it didn't take, you know, of course, the, <coughs> the Crow guys told us, you know, really quickly, is that it's a teepee, you know, and, it, and they are. That, you know, when they moved into the residence, this is in Crow Agency, and so when they moved from, uh, you know, from out in these kind of little camps where they were still living in teepees into the towns, they ended up building these little houses, you know, that, um, that are, uh, you know, they're basically just these small square rooms, you know, that one room, you know, and often, you know, they would still have the teepee liners around the back and so forth, you know. And I, you know, you never would, you just never would see that, you know, unless you, you know, you got out. Um, sort of fascinating stories too. I, I, I'm increasingly, we have talking about this, but I'm really interested in, you know, larger aspects of, you know, kind of landscape history and how buildings are, you know, related. Um, uh, to uh, you know, particular um, you know, uh, aspects of you know, not only topography, but also kind of the social landscape or the social topography. And one of the things, this is in Indiana, and I'll just use these examples, but you know, we, we were, they were tearing this, this building down, and we, we actually have pictures of it when it was, uh, was intact. But we, you know, we discovered this really incredible um, log building that was inside this, you know, this frame house. And, as we were, you know, drawing it, these are, again, this is, you know, just kind of a little field sketch of it, but we could see, you know, that, that um, as, as we started looking at it, we could see that this, the original log house was turned in a way, if you can see on the bottom of this slide, is the pebble, this is the main road down at the bottom, and what happened is that when they built the house is that it was oriented to the barn, into the barnyard. Again, sort of very European, you know, sort of very German, particularly from the part, northern part of, of uh, Germany, you know, to have, you know, a courtyard kind of a f where the, you know, the building you know, would face inward towards the barn. 
So this is probably from the you know, probably 1830s, 1840s, when the Germans were first moving into this part of Indiana. So what happens is about 20 years later, the, the Ronenbaums sell, sell the, uh, the house uh, to the, to the Renna camps, and they turn it into an, ang you know, an Anglo house, an I house, or what we, you know, really typical you know, American house. You know, the, again, with our drawing, you know, this is the original log building here. And so what they do is, that, well, I'm not, I'm, that's not true. This is the original log building here, and this is kind of the addition, this side. And what they did, you know, and, but they also reoriented the whole thing now to the, to the street, the way sort of the Anglo neighbors did. So it's, it's one of those great kind of little stories that architecture could tell us about assimilation and accommodation and acculturation to, um, you know, from, from the Germans into this, uh, you know, into this new world um, uh, landscape. So these kinds of things, you know, in terms of drawings, I mean, they, can, they really can help you. Um, a little miner's house up in Park City. Um, Kate helped me draw, you know, no, you know for, our, for the conference. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I love these little guys, you know, these little single wall houses. But to really understand them, you know, what you have to do is you have to place them in a larger context. I mean, this is, you know, the money that, you know, the, 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 from those miners. And this is, again, sort of the political aspect of this kind of stuff. But you, know, you need to see, you know, the, these, you know, things uh, in relationship to other things. Um, you know, I, I'm particularly architecture. I think, it, you know, it gains so much of its meaning. In a, in a way that you know it you know it when it when we place it you know in a, in a as part of these kind of systems these cultural systems, so what we see you know obviously here you know is that this is you know probably 1910 1920 a little miner's house one one inch wall boards you know and every time we were up there you know Kate's gone now you know but I mean it was it was uh, even it was really cold in the side um, and this is the is this the walker. Yeah, the one, this is the Walker, you know, house. But anyway, I mean, this is the money. And so we need to see these two things always in relationship to each other. You know, South Temple is there because of Park City and these little miners' houses. And so this is, you know, we start understanding class structure, uh, which is, you know, sort of a taboo in this country. You know, we don't really talk about, you know, different kinds of classes and, um, and how they're affected. And I think architecture, again, is an incredible um, source uh, for understanding these kind of relationships. So we draw, and I, we do a number of things. It's not just drawing. And like I said, we're, we're working in the archives, we're doing that kind of work. But drawing and, and documenting is really, really important. And um, the tools are simple. I mean, really, I think, you know, as long as you have a, a mechanical pencil, an eraser, and a, you know, a, a, a rule, architectural rule, and graph paper, um, and a tape measure, you know, you can do it. And people said, well, why don't you use laser, one? you know, just a laser, ta laser tape measure. Um, I don't like them because you, you, you have to shoot, you know, there has to be some kind of end point, you know, they have to, you know, and so much of what we do, you know, you, you don't have, you know, it, it takes you longer to set up, you know, kind of a distance, you know, um, you know something to shoot towards than it does just to measure. So I'm, I'm totally still kind of using, um, you know, just the old style tape measures, 25 and 50 feet, you know. This whole process and all of this stuff is, you know, I think, you know, is, 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 um, is outlined pretty well in, in our little textbook, um, Invitation to Vernacular Architecture. And I think most of you have it. Um, if Allison, if, I guess we might have some if people don't have them. And um, it's part of our... Um, work, you know, and I'll just say tomorrow, you know, we'll go over all of this, you know, but basically what we're doing is that, you know, the, the, the technique that we've learned and that we've developed, it's really actually, uh, it works out really well. We always draw the outside of the perimeter of a building first. So before you do anything, I mean, once you've decided, obviously you've walked around and you've talked about it and you've decided what you're going to do, um, you always measure the perimeter. And you get those measurements and you just draw this big rectangle on your, your sheet. And then you start, again, moving from the outside you know, in. And you know, everything in it, it, it really actually is so, it's so simple if you're willing to take the time to do it. I mean, when it doesn't take that much time, particularly with a, with a square house like this. Um, this is in, 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 Indiana, in Indiana. 
Anyway, you can kind of see, you know, that, you know so you, you run, you know, measurements off from a given point on the corner, and, um, and you, you do the same thing with an elevation. And, you know, we usually go from the, from the gable end, we work from the gable end first, because this way they really design these things, I'm convinced, you know, is that you, you know, because that gives you the pitch of the roof and, um, and you know, basically the depth and whatever, you know, so, you know, and then we can kind of just, and then we can really draw the whole, you know, the whole building. Well, there's some tricks to vertical measurements and we'll, we'll try to go over those. Um, we used to, when we were younger, when I was younger, I used to always try to get up on the roof and, you know, and then hang my, uh, you know, my tape measure down. <laughs> you know, now I don't do that so much. I, <laughs> I have never fallen off of one, you know. I've fallen through a couple of roofs, you know, ceilings, you know. But I'm, uh, and, you know, obviously, you know, the, um, sorry. The, um, do I have, let's see, this should be right. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, the, the, we have to be, a, um, I, I don't want, you know, because, because my interests have been 19th century and neoclassicism. I mean, I think that um, in some ways, you know, that I don't want people to think that that's the only stuff you could measure. Uh, and in fact, I mean, you know, that we've got, I mean, the Utah, you know, is still, you know, absolutely unstudied. Most, almost everything, you know, out, is still out there. So the stories are still all there, you know. Victorian cottages, um, bungalows, you know, my neighborhood even. I mean, you know, we were, I, we were thinking, you know, the day we were going to, you know, I wonder what it would be like to try to count how many of these little prairie, brick prairie bungalows there are uh, in, in as south, what, from about 6th six, six south to about 21st south and from State Street up, you know, up through there. I mean, there must be thousands of them. You know, and I think you know. I think if we talk about vernacular architecture, is the are the common buildings of a of a community. I mean, man, you know. I mean, there's just wh where do they come from? You know, and you don't see them anywhere else. You know, they're really distinctive part of of Utah's landscape. Uh, you know, the cottages. You know, I, I, I you know, it's a it's a wonderful study there, and I'm I'm really into ranch houses right now. You know, I'll explain a little bit. You know about that too. Um, so I think, you know, again, these kinds of, of techniques are, are just as valid for, uh, you know, um, these other kinds of buildings. Um, <laughs> when you get into this stuff, it, it's tough, you know? I mean, I will say, I was working with, at the University of Wisconsin in, in a neighborhood where it was all Victorian, and, and man, you know, <laughs> I talk about intimidating. You know, I, this is one, I don't even know where it is. It's here in Utah. I think it's out in, uh, I, 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 don't, I didn't label this slide, but it's always one of those buildings that I said, boy, I hope I never have to draw that one, you know. <laughs> but these are the kinds of, you know, situations where you kind of, you say, yeah, I mean, you know, do I need, you know, an elevation? And so, but, but it, you know, you can do it. We did, this is down in Bluff, you know, we drew all the buildings down in Bluff. And, you do it the same way, you know, creating these kinds of, you know, these kind of blocks and then subtracting, um, you know, these, the voids or these kind of elements from it. So, um, you know, it can, it can be done. I mean, I just think, like I said, it's easy to cut, really, you know, to kind of go, man, you know, I don't know. But you can learn, you know, we don't know anything about the Victorian uh, era, you know, architecturally in Utah. Um, and I think it's, it's important, you know, think about new ways and, in, in, uh, you know, about mid-century modernism, then, you know, the whole new, um, the new fad uh, uh, in, a, in architectural history is certainly, you know, mid-century stuff. But it's never, nobody ever looks at it from this perspective. And as I've been drawing them, and it's really interesting to see, you know, this is a little split level up on Roosevelt Avenue, 1953. Um, found out the LDS church bought, they were, they, they, there's a church, you know, uh, Award right at the bottom of the hill, I mean the street. So they, they actually the presiding bishop Rick buys the whole street and then develops it. So they keep the church, but you know, but then they sell off the little land. So this is fifty three. You know, I mean I think that's the way it worked. Is certainly from the from the records it seems like it. But it's a wonderful little building, you know, and the materials and um, you know I didn't put the plan here, but. You know, it's, it still preserves in so much of the kind of very conservative internal plan, although you can see them starting to try to open it up. You know, uh, there's no wall. There's a free-standing fire, free, free fireplace between the dining room and the, 
uh, and the uh, living room, but it's real narrow and, and you know, you can kind of see they're still kind of hedging their bets about this new open plan. And so it's, it's a real, um, you know, it's a really fascinating, just materials uh, in terms of, of um, you know, the plywoods and things like that. I mean, that we really, you know, we talk about, um, I think what it's still one of the greatest studies, one of the best studies uh, in my, one, any of my classes was done by a young woman, um, uh, Shamini Wilson, uh, who did a, a study of ranch houses up in uh, Layton. And this is a larger kind of, uh, this is just a little bit, but looking at really at the typology, understanding how they, um, you know, these are just, you know, it was a cul-de-sac and it was just, you know, you know, the standard kind of uh, set of these little ranch houses. And what she found though is, you know, obviously in terms of living spaces and, and the importance, you know, of, of opening certain areas at the same time creating sort of public and private, how they do that. Uh, there's always, you know, you can see all of these, there's to the right side is, is public, you know, with a living room, dining room, kitchen, and the left, you know, now has a new, there's a hallway, <laughs> you know, but then, you know, the mat, you know, uh, a, a main bedroom and so forth and bathroom on the other side. And she also found, she did, part of the study was just this fascinating kind of thing about, you know, particularly, you know, how architecture made, um, you know, the uh, female, women's access to work, <laughs> you know, facilitated that, you know. So in terms of the access to workspace and appliances, um, she uh, was able to diagram this, uh, the visual uh, access over the counter to the family room so that she could watch the children. And then finally, one of the things that we kind of noticed more than anything was this sense of, of a placement, you know, watching, you know, where the, where the mother would sit in terms of the small, you know, built-in um, uh, table. Um, you know, she's always on the uh, outside so that um, she can get to the, you know, the, uh, the stove uh, 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 easily. So these kinds of things, I think, are things that we, you know, sometimes you think about ranch houses and I don't, I don't know, they, they're already been studied or that, that you can get the plan somewhere, whatever, but until you actually really see how they're used and how they're changed and so forth, um, it's really, um, I don't know, I, I think it's really fascinating. I, I've been having a great time out drawing them up. So I misspelled it, <clears throat> but it's the McLaughlin house tomorrow. We're gonna, um, isn't it, is it McLaughlin? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, sometimes my writing, I swear, I swear that was a C. <laughs> but I'd say we're gonna be looking at this little house and, and part of it, um, you know, is, uh, we'll be you know, walking around it and deciding what's important and why we're doing it and, um, and, and then learning how, and it's a, nice, it's a nice size, every group will be able to do both a plan and an elevation uh, and and a, hopefully a detail, I'm hoping, you know, there's some really kind of cool stuff on the inside. And it's a type of house that, you know, there's a, it's a, there's a, I found a couple of other examples. I mean, it was a little one room house or one room with a passage house, uh, the Casto house, which was out in Holiday up on, uh, on the upper part. And then there's a house in Pleasant Grove that, um, that Roger Roper probably took me to a long time ago. Uh, but these little, so it's a, it's a, it's one of these kinds of houses, it's a type, you know, that we're, we're going to see, um, uh, you know, as, as being you know, part of, of, the, of the Utah, you know, repertoire. Uh, it's a small house, but it's not one that's, you know, that's, that's uh, unusual uh, in its, in its, uh, its uh, design. And so I guess, you know, if I have any kind of, uh, you know, final word for any field worker, you know, I, I've decided, you know, in terms of architectural history is that you, you should never trust a building, <laughs> you know, particularly from the road. You know, so I was going to say, I was going to use this as part of you should never trust, you know, your photographs, you know, because, you know, I remember uh, seeing this a long time ago and I was thinking, wow, this is really great. They were able to, uh, you know, um, actually have a his and her bathroom until you turn it around. <laughs> anyway, so thanks. <laughs>